you to all the panelists for extremely rich replies and questions. We're going to end move into the question portion of the program from all of you. Um, I believe we have two roaming mics I see up here. Um, so we have the first question here from the patriarch. I think I'll say that. I mean, uh, you know, changes, changes should be prepared. Should be also, people should be educated. What happened in Iran? We have had security, it was absolute. Now we have nothing. Uh, for uh, for million refugees, the infrastructure is totally destructed. No services, no electricity, schools. And 20% of children are not going to the school. 40% of the Iraqis are jobless. And changing a uh, uh, secular regime, a uh, theocratic regime, is tougher. Look what happened in the area. In Iraq, in Iran, in, uh, in uh, Libya, in Yemen, in Syria. It's an confusion. And why only the West is making a selection of changing uh, regimes? Why are the regimes in the area? They are much more dictator than Saddam Hussein or Bashar al-Assad. I think the, the, the policy of the West is not to uh, help the Christians or to create uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, democracy or freedom. They are talking for interest, and democracy is a big lie. Christians have never supported dictatorships. Um, but that they have actually taken part in patriotic movements of liberation, whether in Palestine, um, in Arab nationalist liberation movements, whether in Egypt against the Mubarak regime, um, whether uh, wherever there is oppression, they have resisted it. But, but what I was trying to say is that, uh, that there are different kinds of authoritarian regimes with implications, which in, in many ways builds on what you're saying. Just, so this is just a small clarification in case I was misunderstood. Thank you. I'll ask you the next question, and I'll also ask if anyone who asks a question, please identify yourself. Okay, my name is Khalid Malik, and I'm from the Lebanese American University. Uh, Professor Landis, you spoke very eloquently about the uh, great sorting out in the event. And uh, I guess that process, which is ongoing, um, raises some questions that I would like to elicit, you know, your views and maybe others on the panel about. Um, since we are dealing with a very heterogeneous region, it seems, at least in theory, that perhaps some form of creative federalism would be the best outcome after this sorting out. Now, it certainly is more appealing than the two extremes, which are either a unitary state uh, dominated by Islamists or by dictators on the one hand, or complete fragmentation. On the other end, um, I sense that Washington uh, has learned something from the Iraq experience, and they, they would like to preserve some sort of state in Syria. So uh, the problem that I see when you say um, that, that there's a, a kind of tendency in Washington to want to empower the Sunnis in, uh, in a place like Syria uh, is, is that uh, there's general neglect of something Alexis de Tocqueville warned us about, which is the tyranny of the majority. And this is very much a danger in a uh, Muslim majority uh, situation where there's very little appreciation historically, as you know, for uh, minority rights. Uh, the whole Limits uh, system is not a system of tolerance. We, we got a lot of romanticism about it from um, Western historians back in the 20th century, but all of that is gone thanks to Bakia or and others who've written about it. Um, so it, it seems to me that if the United States really is serious about freedom, democracy, and human rights, uh, a, a, a serious look should 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 be, should be given to to create federalism, um, and that would preserve the state but configure it differently internally. This brings me to my next point, which is beware of Sunni rump states, because Sunni rump states are simply a recipe for the um, uh, slippery slope down towards you know, monstrous entities like ISIS. 
Sunni moderation has shown it has very little staying power and very little ability to resist that slide down the slippery slope. So again, I would, I would raise that and I'd, I'd be interested in your views. And last, I'm not giving a speech here, I just want to ask questions. Um, it seems to me that the case of Lebanon is, is, is important. Lebanon, you know, already had its civil war and its mini sorting out, as it were, before the Arab Spring. Um, you know, today in Lebanon there, there may be pockets of sympathy for things like ISIS, but they're isolated pockets. There's no craving environment, even among Lebanese Sunnis, for something like ISIS. And the yes, power of the generation... If we could just, in the interest of time, move on to a reply from Professor... Right, Kennedy. let me just finish my last right. point, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, so, in, in, in Lebanon, um, the power configuration right now on the ground is not in favor of Saudi Arabia slash Qatar slash Turkey. It is Hezbollah and the Lebanese army and, and others of, of that sort. So how, how do you see Lebanon proceeding as, as a result as well? Well, Lebanon needs to be protected. And, uh, and, and this provivienda and balance with a third, third, third that has described Lebanon in a sense preserved it from this big sorting out is very important. And I think the Lebanese feel, many of the minorities, both the Shiites and the, the Christians, feel very worried about this new immigration of uh, Syria, because if it's like the Palestinian one before it, it'll end up with more war. And, but the federalism idea is very attractive, but who's going to impose it? That's the problem. It supposes that there's going to be an imperial army that can, that can protect this kind of a federal situation. And that's where I think it's very difficult as a minority today to try to figure out what to tell America. For the United States, the religion of the United States today is democracy and democracy promotion. And so you're really trying to turn around. Um, you're trying to figure out how to use the language of democracy as all of our other people have wrestled, wrestled with in order to, to preach caution, I think in the face of kicking over regimes, and America has been in the business of kicking over regimes in the Middle East, with Iraq, Yemen, Libya, and Syria. In the, in the belief, the blind belief, that democracy is going to be the outcome. And of course, we've seen it's not been the case, and it, what it's done is unleashed this unholy civil war and sorting out. So, I think the best message is to, to, to point that out, that the only mixed society that exists in Syria today is behind the Syrian state lines. The rebel, everything behind the rebel lines has been cleansed. And that message needs to be repeated over and over again, that what they're getting is not pluralism, rule of law, democracy. They're getting a form of fascism and um, intolerance. And it's important to preserve places like Lebanon which are a model, and hopefully to spread that model in the future. But it requires order and authority. Thank you very much. Next question, and we've got 10 minutes, so if I could ask you to pose your question, and we have one here, so simultaneously, and then we'll sort it out from the panel. Thank I'll you. Great. Mustafa Akil from Turkey. Uh, thank you for your presentation. As a Turk myself, I agree with the Hall of Shame of the Turkish Republic since in the past century when it comes to Christian minorities. But I also think that it is something that is a broader problem, which is mirrored on the other side of the region in Greece. Uh, actually, the biggest eradication of the Greek Orthodox from Turkey was through a population exchange Turkey had with Greece in 1922. Turkey expelled its Christian Orthodox population, and in return, Greece expelled its Turks. And when you look at Greece today, the Turkish community there have similar complaints. They can't even really call themselves Turks. Uh, they have to call themselves Muslims of the Hellenistic, you know, identity or something. And issues with the mosques and so on. I'm not saying this to whitewash anything on our side of the problem, but I think it will be a more constructive way to frame the regional problem where sometimes it is nationalism versus nationalism that is creating uh, persecution of minorities uh, on both sides. And to move forward, 
maybe we need to put the picture all together, so uh, for, for both sides, because they believe in reciprocity, which is that uh, to take steps here, we need steps there, that always works. Right? So I just wonder what would you think from, about that perspective, and also I wonder, again, how that perspective can be also brought to Greece, what about the uh, Turks on the other side of the border in, in the Greek uh, Cyprus Republic? Then we call it Southern Greece today, it's the Southern Republic. So just wanted to get your perspective on that. Thank you. Uh, I think these are separate related but ultimately separate issues. Um, and uh, I think it's important to talk about Christians as a whole in Turkey. Um, Greek Orthodox Christians are probably um, the most iconic example of what's happened to Christians as a whole in Turkey. Um, but the formulation that ultimately um, we need to address the Christian plight in Turkey by looking at Greek Turkish issues, I think is a flawed one. Uh, first of all, even if we were to do something as simple as look at numbers, um, we look at the steady decline and near elimination of uh, the Greek Orthodox population in Turkey, whereas that's not the case uh, for the uh, Turkish population in Greece, the Turkish Muslim population, it's grown over a historical time. Um, the kinds of pogroms and violence, stripping of citizenship, um, conversion of worship sites to mosques um, in the occupied section of Cyprus, stables, military spaces that has uh, been visited upon the ethnic Greek population has certainly not occurred with the Turkish population in Greece. So I think we're really comparing apples to oranges here and ultimately I think at the end of the day, focusing on that really takes uh, the uh, takes us away from what's really happening here and that is a fundamental problem of lack of equality before the state. Um, the use of ancestry codes, for example, in Turkey to code uh, Greeks, Armenians, Assyrians, uh, Jews and others, which has been reported in the press by many courageous human rights activists, including people such as yourselves, those are have not been part of the experience for the Turkish Muslim community in Greece. Uh, certainly not, um, you know, as you said, I'm certainly not whitewashing the fact that that community has a economic enfranchisement and political enfranchisement problems. But again, we're comparing apples to oranges, and it feeds into the way in which Christians as a whole in Turkey have been presented in the historiography and certainly in terms of the national security uh, apparatus of the deep state, namely as fifth columns rather than as people who have uh, been historically in those lands and who ultimately are citizens of the state. So I think looking at these issues is important, but I think it's very, I think it's absolutely critical to not resort to a discussion of Greek Turkish issues when it comes to the Christian populations of Turkey. And as far as Cyprus goes, Certainly, if you look at um, the uh, Treaty of Zurich in London, three guarantor powers, Turkey, Greece, and Great Britain, um, and the rights to intervene in Cyprus if there is a problem, but that treaty structure called for a reversion to the status quo ante, and it's been 41 years and there's still not an occupation army in Northern Cyprus, which, by the way, occupies a new territory. So, I, I, my, my focus would be on the um, issues of Equality before the law of all um, religions, uh, rather than putting this one in the context of Greek Turkish um, bilateral relations, because I think ultimately it's a non starter. We have time for one last brief question and a brief reply. My name is Tiffany Brown. We've had a difficult time awakening the global body of Christians to things like the genocide in Iraq and Syria. You both mentioned really kind of the slow strangulation of Christians, both in Turkey and inside Iran. And I would want a specific response on Iran because of the sensitivities of foreign influence um, and uh, the government's kind of rejection of any, of any foreign influence. How practically we can support the Christians. I would say that the closure of all Parsi speaking churches, with the exception of the gathers for very small congregations. Um, since December 2013 is a slow uh, strangulation of the, the Protestant Christian community there. Uh, so very curious to kind of what your response is at that point. Compliance with the social contract, as you said, um, essentially means the non-practice of faith for that Protestant community, even if evangelism isn't a part of it where 
specifically um, speaking the language, as many of these churches existed pre-revolution, if their only language to speak um, is in fact rejecting of the social contract. So very curious to the specific, how do we as, a for as foreigners um, positively influence that slow generation? And, and Elizabeth, maybe how, from your experience with the Turks, um, and the Christians in, the, in Turkey and occupied Cyprus and that slow stimulation and really the silence from the Christian community more generally, how do we awaken the church practically and how do we awaken um, policy and decision makers practically to these slow stimulations and in fact, rather difficult times with more responsibility? We need to, to continue to uh, hold um, the Iranian communities in exile to account. There needs to be they need to, to clarify their positions vis-a-vis -vis these issues. We need to support what we can support, but there are clearly issues that uh, Iranian Christians in exile maybe are exacerbating the problem. Uh, maybe they don't see it that way. Uh, efforts at evangelization from the outside are causing a lot of trouble. And to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And I, I said at the outset, um, you know, recognizing that the fractured state of of Christianity and the church um, has some very deleterious consequences for Christians all over the world. And I think, you know, this is, you know, more than a rhetorical statement. Ultimately, this is an ecclesial statement and it's something that needs to be emphasized. And that, I think, speaks to more general questions of, I guess, I'll call religious literacy amongst Christians outside of, of the Middle East when it comes to an understanding of the church as a global phenomenon uh, with, you know, great pillars of multiple county inside. Um, so I think, to me, that's the most important message. And I also would like to go back to, to Mustafa's question. I think one of the things that uh, has been very important about what's happening with Christians in, in the region is that uh, as over time, conditions for them have become more and more untenable. There has been there have been several actually positive uh, outcomes out of tragedy, and, and two of those are number one. I would say a greater ecumenical awareness. Uh, I think that has uh, been a, a definite outcome of what's happening on the ground. So collaboration and cooperation amongst Christian communities there, but also a greater commitment to interfaith. Um, Collaboration, not only dialogue but collaboration, because a recognition again on the part of all of the communities, whether you know large numbers or small numbers, that um, the weaknesses of any kind of rule of law institutions and democratic political culture have a negative impact. One day it's Yazidis, another day it's Christians, another day it's Sunnis or uh, Alawites, uh, another day it's Shia, and I think again out of the tragedy of the region right now, but the longer term problems in the region that over time there's been a kind of learning curve and a commitment to interfaith cooperation.